Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Peter Husey, and I'm Director of Strategic Deterrent Studies here at the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies, and welcome to the Nuclear Deterrence Forum series. We are very pleased today to have Major General Retired Michael Fortney joining us today. He's Executive Director of M. Fortney Consulting, a firm that specializes in technical and leadership advice and still serves our nuclear community and various other endeavors. General Fortney previously served as the Vice Commander and Director of Operations at Air Force Global Strike Command, as well as Director of Operations and Nuclear Support at the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. He's a 39-year veteran of the United States Air Force. And welcome, uh, General. I want to thank you for making the time to join us today. Uh, for our audience, feel free to raise your hand. That's the function on your computer. And uh, use the function and submit a question in the Q&A window anytime during the discussion. And we'll get to those questions in the second half of the hour. So now, General Fortney, over to you for your opening remarks. All right. Well, very good. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Peter. And thank you and the entire Mitchell team for putting on this series. I, I think it's just wonderful. Um, I also want to say thanks to those that uh, all these busy people, uh, very important people that took time to dial into this discussion today. I know you're very, very busy, um, especially virtually. These sessions are always just a little bit clunky. I mean, we're all grateful to have Zoom and Skype and GoToMeeting and all these other services, but they're always a little bit clunky. Uh, but what I, you know, I'm sitting in a back office in Southeast Texas in my home wearing my grandson's gaming headset. And so uh, this is not the way you'd like to have this discussion, but here we are. I will tell you that this is shaping up a little bit better than the last time Peter asked me to come and speak. Uh, Peter, you probably don't remember, it was three or four years ago. I was still on active duty, uh, and I was a member of about a five uh, person team that you had come in and speak there in DC. And uh, you sandwiched me in between two of the icons of nuclear deterrence to talk about deterrence. So I had to speak in between General Larry D. Welch and Ambassador Bob Joseph. You know, I felt like a rookie quarterback in the NFL, you know, sandwiched in between Montana and Brady. It was uh, a little bit humbling. I'm sure it was stimulating, though. Uh, I'll give an apology up front. It's not really an apology. It's an explanation. You know, I'm not going to speak about some of the typical issues that are really big and burning in the press right now. We'll touch on them tangentially, but I'm not going to focus on the imperative of, of a strong nuclear deterrent, even triad recapitalization or the new, new security landscape. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on that. We can we can peel into any of that in the Q&A if you'd like. But these are, these are current events. They're very important. Um, and I ask you to stay tuned into those. As I know you are, you would be dialed in today. And you know, read what Peter puts out uh, at the Mitchell Institute and the other, other avenues out there to stay current on those. Likewise, I'm not going to be sharing any deep new thoughts on revelations on uh, nuclear deterrence. Others do that very, very well. You know, read anything that Dr. Payne puts out or Matt Gronick publishes. Um, I will always be pleased when they put something else new out, especially uh, Dr. Payne's new book. If you haven't had a chance to read it, I highly recommend it. Well, enough on what I'm not going to talk about. Uh, what I will offer today is a few thoughts on what I think has not changed when we think of nuclear deterrence in the 2020s and beyond. So what has not changed? You know, Peter already said, you know, I was in the Air Force for 39 years. Most of that was my commissioned life, and all of that was in the nuclear arena. You know, there were a couple of assignments at STRATCOM, a lot of time at the unit, test, headquarters, DITRA, like I said, STRATCOM. And so I've been thinking about and talking about and writing a little bit about nuclear deterrence for a long time. So getting back to my theme, then I'm, I'm struck um, by in the fundamental areas of nuclear deterrence, what has not changed, not changed over the last few decades. Of course, a lot has changed. I mean, a ton has changed on the security landscape. And I said I wasn't going to talk about it too much. And I'm not going to dwell on it. But deterring bad actors today is much more complicated than it ever was before. I mean, in addition to dealing with terror, as we have been for 25 plus years, you've got the phenomenon of undeclared conflict like we saw in the Crimea and the Ukraine, the so-called little green men phenomenon. 
cyber cyber threats and vulnerabilities. All you got to do is open the newspaper up the last couple, three weeks, and you see evidence of that and where this could go. Space is a contested environment. A resurgent Russia. And that should be in bold. A resurgent Russia. And a near-peer challenger in China that's constituting a triad will probably double its nuclear capability in the next few years. I mean, these are significant challenges. And, uh, and, and, and. I mean, I could just go on. And deterring across that vast spectrum is much more complicated than it ever was before. And, you know, make no mistake about it, deterring across all these fronts is strategic deterrence. And strategic deterrence is, of course, much broader than nuclear deterrence. You know, I think in our community, in my community, especially, you know, 10 years ago or so, we did a great disservice, myself included, by sometimes taking those terms, nuclear deterrence and strategic deterrence, and completely overlapping them in conversation. And so whenever we talked about strategic deterrence, we were really talking about nuclear deterrence. So now, you know, when someone like myself or a nuclear proponent, anyone uh, comes out and says, hey, there are fundamental things in nuclear deterrence that haven't changed. Even in the strategic context that we described earlier, all those changes, if we say that certain fundamentals haven't changed, sometimes you get the eye roll. You know, and, oh, here they go again. Uh, these old Cold War thinkers are stuck in an old paradigm and they just won't budge. You know, it's like we just walked off of a Stanley Kubrick movie set or something, and I call this the strange love effect. It's the eye roll that we get. But, but I do contend today that the fundamentals of nuclear deterrent haven't changed over the last few decades, if, if ever. Well, how can that be true if that overall deterrent picture, as we just discussed, is much more complicated? Well, I'm not suggesting, of course, and I'll say it again, that big D deterrence, capital D deterrence is unchanged. I'm saying the, the fundamentals of that subset of nuclear deterrence, I believe, are fundamentally unchanged. They're as valid today as they ever were before. And this relies on a couple of simple components, and this is gonna sound really basic, and I apologize. Um, we deter overt aggression of nuclear peers and the use of nuclear weapons to a combination of the right nuclear capabilities and the demonstrated will to use them. That was true 50 plus years ago, and I believe it's true today. And I'm gonna unpack this just a little bit more at the risk of sounding pedantic to a, a group of people like you. These capabilities that we're talking about today in the 2020s and beyond must be diverse enough to affect the decision calculus of a well and diversely equipped adversary across a wide spectrum of nuclear operations for them to be credible. Said another way, we need nuclear capabilities that are believably usable at all ends of the nuclear conflict spectrum. And second, we have to be seen as having the will to use these forces if needed. And will is communicated in a bunch of different ways, of course. The systems that we pursue and fund, how we test, how we exercise, the policies that we have, both the declared and unofficial undeclared policies, our treaties, our agreements, all of these send messages about our will when it comes to how the use of our nuclear forces. And, and this is a big and, our capabilities and policies have to be credible with a capital C for deterrence to be effective. So what affects credibility? Well, I, I'm going to turn that on its head and describe what I think a uh, force would look like or policies might look like that are not credible today when facing the adversaries, the potential adversaries we're facing. And we'll peel this back a little bit more later. It's a force. It's not credible. It's too small in number to adequately deter. It's not diverse enough to deter or reestablish deterrence at the low end of nuclear conflict. And it's not credibly. Okay, so what I was talking about before I was cut off is um, our, what, our force has to be credible, credibly usable. Again, if an adversary is tempted to use a low-yield nuclear device at the beginning of a conflict, will our adversary be deterred by, let's say, a Miniman 3 out of North Dakota or a D5? Of course not. I think it's silly to think that they might. And on the policy side, if we allow ourselves to go too low in number and not diversify across all levels of nuclear conflict, again, our only fast response 
to that low yield kind of option is a Miniman 3 or a D5. And then furthermore, how does that affect what we're able to hold at risk? This goes into the policy and the strategy side of the house. Low numbers of weapons suggest a reversion. And uh, Matt Croning did a wonderful job during a testimony recently. I read part of the transcript talking about this. But low numbers of weapons suggest a reversion to a counter-value kind of targeting scheme. And that would have to be our policy. That would have to be our strategy from the United States of America. Is it believable or is it credible that the world's leading democracy and advocate for human rights would really consider a counter-value type strategy, holding population centers at risk? No, I think that creates a hollow deterrent. No adversary would believe that that is credible across all levels of nuclear conflict. So. I do contend that the world is an incredibly more complicated place and strategic threats we need to defer, deter are very, very diverse right now. Think big D deterrence. But those fundamentals, the combination of capability and will and credibility of both of those are fundamentally unchanged. And that, of course, as we touched on a little bit, has implications for force structure and policy going forward. Okay, so the world's a crazier place, hard to turn at the strategic level. Strategic level. Um, but I believe that nuclear deterrence remains a unique subset of big D deterrence worthy of special treatment, and it has a special place. Um, because as much as we might like it to be true, there's no evidence that I have ever seen that cyber capabilities, offensive space capabilities, and precision conventional forces, or probably even hypersonics, at least at this point, um, can have the same effect, deterrent effect, as nuclear weapons. And nuclear weapons are special, and they're thought of specially. They're unique. They have unique controls and safeguards, unique rules for employment, unique treaties, unique effects, unique calls for prohibitions. And importantly for deterrence thinking, a unique gravitas associated with their use and the need to prevent their use. So unchanged reality number one, Nuclear weapons remain unique in their ability to deter head-to-head -head conflict with peer or near-peer, similarly equipped competitor. And deterring is, must be credible in both areas of capability and will. All right, so let's move on a little bit. I contend today there's a second contextual reality that we have to deal with and recognize, and it has to do with the, the dialogue surrounding the utility and need for our forces. There are really two camps out there, and there have been for decades, and there's very little in between. Um, and believe it or not, I struggled uh, with this for a long time. You know, why was it that's what's so clear to me? Um, I'm a very linear thinker. I'll admit that right up front. But why is what's so clear to me so unclear to others? And I had a – I won't call it an obsession. It wasn't even close to that. But a preoccupation of trying to understand why the other side thinks like they do. And I had that for years. I even went so far as to ask three different Stanford fellows, those are the Air Force officers who go to Stanford to study for a year, to take on a project every year and come back and tell us why do they think like they do. And I don't mean that to sound dismissive or pejorative. It really wasn't. I was genuinely interested in understanding how brilliant, well-educated, respected people, these are secretaries, generals, think tank PhDs, you all know who I'm talking about here, and how could they come to such wildly different conclusions than I do, given the same set of facts? Um, my thinking, again, was if we understood the logic a little better, we could communicate a lot better. But I will tell you that I gave up that wind-chasing exercise a few years ago after a, a chat with a, a mentor and a well-respected author. You know, I shared my internal dilemma with him and that preoccupation, and he said something um, that caused me, again, to, to quit trying to explain it. You know, again, I'm a very linear thinker, and I, I like to think I take a look at the strategic environment. I look at A plus B plus C. I draw conclusions, and then I come up with D, whatever that answer is. But this nuclear leader, this Jedi in our community, um, told me that um, the problem is the other side, or many on the other side, often start the discussion with the end already in mind. And then they will look at parts of solutions to fill the A plus B plus C because they've already decided what D is. And D, the answer to many on the far side of this community is that zero weapons is best, and that's the ultimate good. And less is better. 
And so anything that you can do to get down that road gets them to their answer a little bit better. You know, it's why brilliant advocates, all, all the writing in the world that Peter does and many like him do, and our brilliant advocates over the years, Payne, Cronin, Chilton, Roberts, Joseph, Haney, Hyten, Richard, Meese, I mean, you name it. Um, why haven't they been able to convince? Well, the folks on the other side, they're just not wired that way. You know, and I remember hearing an anecdote from a colleague several years ago. Um, this was a pro staffer on one of the armed services committee. And I'll just, and I'll just leave it at that for an explanation, but they were asked before a testimony once to, to meet with one of the members and give a 30 minute discussion to describe um, the efficacy of the triad, why the numbers are as they are, why they need to be where they are. And the staffer told me that the session was amazing. It was awesome. Um, he thought he nailed it. All the facts were laid out throughout the discussion, lots of head nods and, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. A, lot, a lot of that, only to have the member ask at the very end of the discussion, okay, I heard everything you said, but why three legs of the triad and why so many? I mean, it was like it went right over the person's head. And it, it became apparent to that person anyway that no matter how many times I repeat these things, I'm just not going to get through to some folks. Okay, so another reality has not changed is the mind of those opposed to the nuclear deterrent. Now, what, what that doesn't mean is we throw up our hands and quit talking, writing, and conveying, you know, the pragmatic truth. You know, Dr. Payne's research of a few years ago does a great job pointing out the disparity in what's being written. Um, those on the other side than I am write a whole lot more. It's have, you know, the writing is heavily weighted. But we have to understand that our audience is not that fringe element that are dogmatically tied to that position B that I talked about earlier. Our audience, when we talk about this, is the public, is the unconvinced military and DOD leader, and especially our elected leaders. These are the people that make the policy, provide the resources, and ultimately bear the weight of defending this nation and the very stability of the globe. That's not hyperbole. I really believe that that's what's at stake here. So what's the approach then? First, I suggest we don't apologize for sounding a little bit old school in our discussions about the importance of nuclear deterrence. You know, some of it's, some of it's old, but it's true and it's tested. Well, what do I mean by that? I mean, I've watched over the years as our team, I think, has sometimes tried to too cleverly reframe many of the fundamentals of nuclear deterrence thinking. That doesn't mean that things change and we shouldn't adapt. That's not what I'm saying at all. But I believe in an attempt sometimes to, to tip the hat to those unconvinced that we're not Cold War relics. Um, and again, to counter that strange love effect that we create new terms, complicated OV1s and charts and PowerPoints. And uh, I don't know how many in the audience remember the new triad concept of the early 2000s. Do you remember when that came out? In my mind, it's a classic example of trying to sexy up basic deterrence, nuclear deterrence with new lingo definitions and diagrams. It died. It didn't die because it was silly. Because if you look at it, it, it made tremendous sense. It was an attempt to describe big D deterrence, but it left nuclear deterrence, um, let's just say, not, not focused upon. It died because, in my opinion, it tried to rebrand and re-explain what needs no new explanation. So first I suggest we be a little bolder in our presentation of the case describing the uniqueness of our weapon systems. Second, I suggest that every leader in our mission area be ready to discuss these issues at a, any moment, on a moment's notice. You know, I recall my most vivid failure as an advocate. I was a baby one star. I think I was stationed at Ditter at the time. I was called to a very senior uh, a civilian DOD leader's office to talk about something completely unrelated um, to nuclear weapons. So I sat down across from him at his coffee table, and the first thing out of his mouth was, oh, that's right, you're in the Air Force. Tell me, why the hell is the Air Force so fixated on needing a penetrating bomber and a new nuclear cruise missile? You know, I, I have no idea, to be honest with you, how I stammered and answered that question, but I was apparently not very compelling based on this principled public attack on Lurso um, that followed in the coming months. Um, so you got to be ready. And I share this be ready message. You know, I, I mentor at the NC3 courses and the new 400 courses for the Air Force, and that's a course for 06s, GS15s, younger GOs, and SESs. And I tell them they have to be ready for the conversation. 
because anytime anyone sees you um, with bomber wings on or uh, a submariner's patch or a missile badge on, you immediately become the voice of that community. And the opportunity might be a CODEL or a staff DEL visiting the base, a trip to D.C. to visit a member, a testimony, testimony prep, a budget battle uh, in the half, a session in the tank, or even uh, a town hall meeting with our airmen and our sailors. You know, the good news, as I talked about before, the target in this dialogue for us, I don't think, is the, not the zealot on the far left here. Um, it's not the global zero crowd. Again, it's the public, the DOD leadership, and importantly, again, that elected leadership to carry the weight of defending this nation and the stability of the globe. And there's a lot of good news here. As many are now saying, in, in the last 13 administrations, every president once faced with the weight, with the gravitas of the obligations of their office has either built, modernized, or supported a strong triad. Some more than others, but they've all stayed the course. When faced with that pragmatic weight of office and no longer sitting in the cheap seats, no administration is elected to alter the fundamental deterrence equation. In my mind, this bodes well for reason and pragmatism. But again, we still have to make the case. There's new personalities at play. And as I mentioned before, we have to keep writing and talking. We have to explain that our triad has stood the stabilizing test of time from a strategic perspective. We have to talk about how tampering with the successful equation could have disastrous destabilizing effects on our posture around the globe. And once we get on the downslope of that and it becomes too unstable, I don't think we'll ever get it back. We got to challenge the assertions of the de and the deterrence efficacy of the low number dyad, uh, low number dyad or monad community. We got to ask, where's the historical precedent? Of course, there is none. And then we have to ask, where are the studies? There are none. Um, and a lot is at stake here to base on a gut feel. You know, I've read the transcripts before, speeches that have been made by different people. Oh yeah, I believe we can deter with two to three hundred weapons and a monad, or maybe a small dyad. Okay, well, where do you get that from? You know, where does that come from? Show me the study. Show me who signed on to that. Um, because, frankly, I just don't see it, and there's a lot at stake here. And we have to, again, be ready to take on and lay bare the unsubstantiated assertions of the, the hair-trigger asserters. And I call them asserters because they are assertions. They're not based in fact. And we have to do it unemotionally with fact, experience, and reason. And we have to continue to make the case for the reconstitution of our triad. It's needed based on the proven deterrent capability that it provides. And we can talk more about that later if you want to. Along with, finally, making the argument that this nuclear recapitalization makes sense. And it's affordable. And it's not only affordable, it's probably a bargain. And again, we can talk about that more if you like. So these conversations have to continue. Um, I'll stop there. We didn't discuss a lot of things today in my opening remarks. We can peel into anything that you'd like to. Um, and if I don't know the answer, Peter, I'm sure will. Um, so any questions are fair. Um, Peter, uh, the Mitchell team, thank you again for putting this on, and uh, thank you for all for dialing in. This dialogue is important to the nation, and as I mentioned before, I think the very stability of the globe. So with that, I'll pause. Thank you very much, uh, General Courtney. Um, number of questions I have. Um, many currently serving military officers have in conversations said, we're not only facing competitors, but they're nuclear armed. And we have never fought a conventional war with a nuclear armed adversary, let alone two. And there is increasing evidence that China and Russia are cooperating with each other militarily on a variety of things. So, how would you think American nuclear deterrent strategy would change in light of what is called the conventional nuclear integration problem? Yeah. And, uh, you know, on, on the U.S. side of the house, conventional, conventional nuclear integration is, is growing uh, by leaps and bounds. And those who are familiar with the mission set, um, if you would dig into it and talk to the folks at uh, – Air Combat Command and uh, Air Force Global Strike, you'll see uh, uh, a cooperation and working together an exercise um, that you've never seen before. Uh, we recognize that any conflict is probably not going to start with the least likely scenario, and this that massive 
you know, over the pole kind of thing. It's going to start small, and then it's going to escalate. And then when an enemy sees our con- our conventional might and our commitment, our NATO forces, and their backs are in a corner, um, that's when the most likely of the least likely scenarios is going to happen. And that's a low yield option. So what does that mean? Well, it means a lot. I mean, a lot means a lot for us to credibly be able to deter that. As I mentioned earlier, you can't just rely on something that comes out of a, a, a D5 or a hole in North Dakota or Montana. You have to have capabilities that span that entire spectrum. You know, and, and people, you know, and, and I said this before in a speech in DC's, D.C. somewhere, that our weapons have to be perceived as usable. And that, that caused a little bit of a, of a ruckus. You know, the Global Strike Command Vice said our weapons need to be usable. Well, they have to be perceived to be usable across all levels of the spectrum of conflict. So I think, Peter, fundamentally first, I, I think uh, the previous administration was on the right track uh, with uh, Pursuit of Slickham and uh, B-5 Light. I think those are two capabilities that were needed, but I'm not sure that even goes far enough. I think we have to have the right capabilities to keep this thing tamped down at a lower level, op- optimally, to deter it from ever going. Um, but once it starts, or if it starts, to be able to respond with something in kind. I think that's credibility. I'd like you to address uh, another issue, which as Vice Commander at Global Strike, you probably had this come across your desk, and that is, well, we don't need to have a new ground-based strategic deterrent. We can go with Minuteman and ex- instead of taking it out in 2035, which would be the last missile to come out of the silo, that's an old Minuteman three. We just continue it, let's say for another 10 years and wait around before we do a modernization program in GBSD. Um, could you address that issue as to how you see that option? Yeah, uh, I can. And, um, Folks with a lot more stars in current setting positions have done a great job with that. You know, if you take a look at Admiral Richard's last testimony, it was wonderful. Um, the things that General Ray has said in the recent past, but, um, you know, it's a 50 year old weapon system. It's really 50 plus year old weapon system. We focus a lot on the Minuteman 3 itself, the booster and the guidance system. Well, that thing's been LEP to death, life extended program, LEP to death over the decades. And frankly, we're just out of juice. I mean, could you life extend a guidance system? Could you put a new booster in the hole? Yeah, I suppose you could. Could you buy a little more time? I'm not convinced that's going to buy you more time because the weapon system is more than the booster and a guidance system. I mean, the weapon system, for those who are really familiar with it and those that aren't, man, you really got to dig into it. It's the launch tubes. It's the rusty suspension systems. It's the... Uh, HVAC systems that keep those uh, the temperature right down in the silos and in the launch control centers. It's the blast doors. It's the hardness items. It's the vanishing vendor issue that we have here. You know, to keep that entire weapon system operating for even 10 more years without a planned replacement is just crazy in my mind. And it ignores, you know, the studies that uh, the Air Force did before embarking on GBSD, at least two studies that I know of. Um, show um, how we're throwing money away if we do that. And then what this also doesn't address is the operational gaps that might exist or will exist, you know, five to ten years from now. That's why it's imperative that GBSD stay on track. Right. I'm going to combine two questions. Um, One came in uh, on the chat function. The other I was going to ask you, and that is... What are the new capabilities that B-21 and GBSD bring to the table that you find persuasive in terms of, yes, we need those capabilities to maintain our deterrent strategy? Yeah. And uh, first of all, we need a future bomber. Uh, We need a future bomber um, for a lot lot of different reasons. You know, first of all, we're not going to replace the B-52, at least not for a long time. The B-52 is needed. It's a great standoff uh, capability, as General Wilson used to say. The B-52 is the best bomb truck for the buck that the U.S. has ever flown. Um, You used to call it the, the iPod of airplanes. You can strap anything on it and use it. And the combatant commanders know it. 
And so our bomber force right now, you know, if you talk to the folks at Global Strike Command, you know, I'd put our bombers up there as HDLD assets. I mean, they're in such high demand now. I mean, you've got the STRATCOM, the G, you know, the STRATCOM uh, requirement that has to, you know, be shepherded all the time. But then the, just by sheer numbers, the bomber force is being stretched too thin. And so, you know, in, as far as specific capabilities, you know, I, I remember when the requirements for the Raider were being put together, the B-21 were being t- put together. And I'm not going to speak specifically about that, but what I will tell you is it can do anything that it needs to do. It is an amazingly capable airplane. And you put that in the right number along with the B-52 flying into the future. And, and you know, people look at the B-52 and they just don't understand it. Um, okay, this airplane, you know, uh, designed in the 40s and 50s, you know, it, it's been around forever. It's going to be a 100-year-old airplane. Everyone likes to talk about that. You know, this airplane with a new engine, it was reskinned back in the 80s. The airframe is in tremendous shape. You know, with the right upgrades, um, this airplane is going to be flying for decades longer. So um, those two forces together in the airplanes together make up a great bomber force. And trust me on the capabilities, the B-21 would be able to do anything that we want it to do. Let me ask you, General, a two-part question that has come in. Two questions. There are actors like North Korea and Iran that one has nuclear weapons, one does not, but is seeking them. And the issue there is often they're not really deterred by our nuclear deterrent because they're, uh, you know, they're willing to die for what they want. And uh, the other thing is, what about putting nuclear weapons overseas beyond the bombers we have in, or the planes we have in England, for example, and Turkey, which are theater systems, they're not part of our central strategic uh, system. So two questions. One is, how do you deal with, it's often referred to as rogue states, but these are Sometimes we even talk about non-state actors. How do you deter them? And second, does it make any sense to move some of our deterrent overseas? Yeah. Um, looking at the first first question first, um, with Iran and Korea, granted two different actors, um, two different states of mind, I would push back a little bit on, on the question of their, that they're willing to die. Um, and by that, I assume you mean willing to go away. They're willing to erase their country, their regime, um, yes. for the sake of whatever cause they believe in. Uh, I'm not convinced that's true. Um, uh, not not at all. But anyway, uh, actors like that, go, go back to the big D deterrence discussion. They may not be held at risk um, by some of the triad forces that we have now. These smaller capabilities, perhaps. But again, that's why big D deterrence. Um, you have all elements of national power that need to be brought to bear. You know, it's diplomatic, it's informational, military is just one piece of it. And then, of course, the economic sanctions piece. Smaller countries like that um, can be really, and I call them stronger countries, that sounds dismissive, it's not meant to be. Um, but all those tools of the dime need to be leveraged against those smaller countries. It's not just about deterring with our nuclear weapons. It's those other suite of things that are available. As far as, uh, you know, deploying uh, other assets overseas, you know, I'm probably the wrong person to ask about that, but my, my gut says um, not necessary um, to do that. And the reason being the standoff capabilities that we do have are uh, uh, pretty impressive. And the ones that we're developing are going to be even more impressive. And so moving things forward, I think is probably a, not a smart thing right now um, when we're seeing what the AT, A2 AD environment looks like in some theaters. The closer right. you get it, the more um, at risk it is. And so uh, I think we need to put um, more eggs in the basket of long range and standoff as opposed to forward deployment and set up a target area for someone to attack. Good you, question. You, you answered the question that I was going to ask, which was, do we need both a penetrating and standoff bomber capability? And you kind of answered that question. Let's go to the, another one, which is you serve as a mentor to the U.S. Air Force's senior level NC3 course. And as we field these uh, new systems, what attributes do you see as important in the next generation NC3? 
that aren't necessarily uh, uh, around when we first developed these systems? Yeah, that, that's a, a wonderful question, Peter. Um, thank you. You know, first, it's um, ensuring that our legacy systems, you know, the next step is getting the new weapon systems online, you know, the B-21, the GBSD, and making sure that those legacy thin line systems operate um, with the new weapon systems. I mean, that is absolutely an imperative. And uh, the new weapon center, the PEO for NC-3 systems is doing a wonderful job um, working with both those development teams to make sure that that can happen. And so, you know, you got to maintain the thin line. you got to maintain what we have until it's replaced. And I would say there's a lot of thought right now on, uh, that sounds uh, a little bit vague, you know, U.S. Strategic Command is putting a lot of thought into this. Global Strike Command is putting a lot of thought into what that next generation of NC3 capabilities look like. And if you haven't heard what General Hyten has said about it, um, he's talked about it a lot, you know, both when he was at STRATCOM and, and as the vice. Um, and he does a real good job describing it. You know, we, we have a plethora of ways to get communications um, right now to the right people. And the crew member on alert in a missile silo or in a bomber or in a sub, they don't care how they get the message. They just want to get the message. And so you inundate the systems that we have. One will get through. You maintain a thin line, whatever that thin line looks like in the future. And it needs to be heavily, heavily secured and reliable. But then you bombard the system. Now, that system of systems for NC3, as it starts to emerge, is going to have to um, fall underneath the JADC2 construct. And uh, some teeth was put into that in recent months. Uh, I think I read an article on that, that services will comply with the construct of JADC2. And what, what that means, then, is anything that is developed uh, across um, not just NC3, but command and control across the board, these systems have to be integrated. So if we're not creating a conventional system and a nuclear system and, and one for NLCC and one for Coop COG, I mean, that all of these systems uh, will be integrated and so we're not duplicating expenses and, and capabilities and systems. So I think the JADC2 framework is going to give us the ability to leverage what everyone's doing across the DOD to come up with those systems that can be used for not only NC3, but uh, in support of the COCOMs and uh, National Leadership Command and Control and Communications, uh, you know, here in CONUS. I hope that's helpful. It is very helpful. It, it answered a question that came in on NC3 that we know. What, I have a question that, uh, you know, Professor Von Hippel, who is associated with the Global Zero program at Princeton University, has repeatedly written occasionally with uh, Dr. Perry, our former Secretary of Defense, that we rely as a country on a policy of launch on warning. And if you remember back in 1997, Bob Bell, who was the top arms control nuclear deterrent specialist on the National Security Council, held a special press conference to address just that issue because there were comments in the media that the 1994 Nuclear Posture Review had adopted a launch on warning policy for the United States but basically didn't tell anybody. And he was adamantly pushed back on that. And now Professor Hippo has said, we don't need ICBMs and really shouldn't have them because they rely on launch on warning in order to use them. And the warning could be fake, could be false warning, could be mistaken. And so we would might, we basically could launch, uh, initiate a nuclear war by mistake, so to speak. Would you address those issues about um, launch on warning being either is or is not a U.S. policy and how that is relevant to the ICBM leg of the triad. Yeah, I, I would push back a little bit on uh, that it was our policy, you know, the policy with a capital P to launch on warning. Has it always been available? Yes. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, um, attestation uh, and dual phenomenology here in just a second um, that makes this a, a little bit or a lot of bit less scary. But, um, you know, I, I don't think you want to tie your hands with a policy declaration that we will never launch on warning. Because now, first of all, is it believable? 
You know, it's like a no first use policy. Is it even believable if a, a country is backed into a corner or perceives itself backed into a corner and they've signed up to as an NFU a no first use or will never launch on warning? Um, does it really tie their hands not to do so? Well, no, of course not. But from a policy perspective, um, a little bit of ambiguity, purposeful ambiguity in our statements and our policies strengthens deterrence. It does. You know, I recall a vignette, um, and Peter, you and I talked about this once. It was uh, Secretary Brown, I believe, under the Carter administration, when he was being asked a question from a podium. They were talking nuclear issues. And he was asked specifically, you know, Secretary, Mr. Secretary, is it the policy of the United States never to launch on warning? And his response, I thought, was interesting. Um, and Peter, if I remember correctly, you might have even been there um, when the question was asked. But um, his response was, no, it, it is the policy of the United States not to launch on warning. And then he turned away, came back to the podium and said, but we reserve the right to do so if it's in our best interest. Well, I mean, to the community, that was speaking out of both sides of its mouth, you know, to the listener. Um, but yet that was purposeful. Um, because you don't want to paint yourself into a corner with a policy, whether that's launch on warning, um, no first use, which are closely linked. You know, right. this kind of goes into the discussion, Peter, I think where you're going. Um, are the are the ICBM forces um, just ready to launch on a moment's notice? The whole, whole hair trigger discussion. Um, you know, the, the anecdotes that are used, um, you know, the 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 test tape that was loaded um, incorrectly, another computer chip issue, Th those issues were resolved within minutes. They were resolved within minutes. And I can tell you personally from being an AEAO aboard the AVNCAP that um, I, and, and having watched numerous exercises, I won't go too far here, um, we never, military advisors never pressure the decision maker, the president of the United States into making any decision. You know, the president's given options and that's all the president is given. He's given options and advice. And so the thought that somehow there's a Whopper system out there and it's immediately going to engage and a bunch of um, warmonger generals are going to be pushing the president to launch on warning. That's just not true. That's not what happens. And then you take and you put the safeguards on top of that, you know, to talk to the hair trigger myth, you know, um, but there are the personnel, the procedural, the, the coding systems, the dual phenomenology um, that has to take place is much, much more sophisticated than it was even 40 or 50 years ago. And it was impressive back then. So uh, I guess the, the core of the answer is um, I wouldn't say we would never, if I were a policymaker, I would never say we would never launch on warning. But I would also never say that that's our policy. I would probably take a Secretary Brown approach on that one. Thank you. I, I would like to mention the, the couple former STRAT commanders helped me uh, unwind that issue. And they, they said that we have to have dual phenomenology in order to have a confirmed launch. And that would be our satellites see the launch, the plume of the rocket, our radar see a track of where the missile is going. And that you're right in, in the 1979 and 1980 false warnings were resolved. Uh, the, then they were, they were, fixed, they couldn't do this again. And uh, the, the two, one general, one admiral told me that in the 70 years of the nuclear age, we have never convened a launch or threat conference, which is all the senior advisors sitting down and saying, we have a launch, we've confirmed, and now we have to figure out what the threat is, where's is it going? And it was remarkable to me, they both said, we have never convened such a conference and that when you add it up, the ICBMs and SLBMs have been on alert 72 million minutes since 1958. So all during that period of time, through all the crisis we've been through, the Cuban Missile Crisis, Berlin, the Middle East, no president has ever been, no one has laid on the table, Mr. President, you have to make a decision, which I think is remarkable uh, with respect to the, the value of the deterrent policy that we've adopted and how it has worked. Um, another question related to this is, what would be the impact if the United States, let's say it's for money reasons, decided let's go to a diet and let's just go to submarines and bombers. 
and that's it. Uh, what, in your view, how would that affect our friends and our adversaries in terms of how they would react? Yeah. First of all, uh, let, let's talk about our friends, our allies. There are probably about 30 countries neatly tucked up underneath the U.S. deterrent umbrella to include some of the nuclear powers that we're very good friends with that have smaller forces. Um, what kind of message do we send them, especially advanced countries that are capable of building their own systems right now, if we pull back um, significantly? And eliminating you know, the land-based leg of the triad would be a significant um, pullback. Um, no one else has that on our side. Um, no one else has that. And that quick reaction capability that I believe is, has been key, along with the other legs that try to keep things stable over the years. So I think you send an interesting message to our allies and our friends that are tucked up underneath that nuclear umbrella. And that's why, you know, keeping a strong triad like it does um, is a non-proliferation tool. It keeps others from exploring capabilities because they don't need to. We know they have their back. So that's how I think it could possibly affect the allies. Um, and how does it affect our adversaries? Well, it tremendously would uncomplicate their targeting strategy. Oh, my gosh. Right now, you know, if you want to, to uh, eliminate the ICBM leg of the triad, it's going to take a massive attack on sovereign U.S. soil of probably somewhere near 1,000 warheads. Oh, my gosh. That's a significant commitment. I mean, that is um, – the, the global conflict that everyone fears. It's never happened. We've never come close to that because that force is a stabilizing force that sits out there. Um, so I think it's destabilizing. I think you remove your fast reaction capability. I think you definitely, significantly uncomplicate the enemy's strategy. And uh, so I, I think it's a bad idea. And furthermore, as I alluded to in, in my remarks, you know, for those that say, uh, just go to a dyad and save some money. Well, yeah, it may save some money. Um, but what could it potentially cost us? You know, it could, it could potentially cost us our influence overseas, our very way of life, and make us subservient to the whims of one of our strategic competitors. And I don't think that's uh, what we want in this country. Why mess with something that we know works? I have another question, uh, General. That has to do with the no first use. China adopted such a policy in 1964. And Russia, as you know, had a policy of no first use rhetorically, and then they dropped it in 1993. And both China and Russia have moved in the direction of what General Hyten calls escalate to win, which is the threatened limited use of nuclear forces uh, in a crisis or threat, threatened use to get us to stand down. If we, in the face of these, adopted, well, let's adopt a no first use because we're not going to initiate a nuclear exchange. What is your view? What would be the impact on our, poli on our again, our friends and our adversaries of if we adopted such a policy? Yeah. And, uh, you know, to me, I, I scratch my head a little bit, you know, when I think about no first use, and I know that's it's being talked about a whole lot now, and I know the administration is considering it. I don't know, I don't know where we'll end up on this, but to me, it's a, it's a solution looking for a problem. Um, again, purposeful ambiguity in policy, I think, is important for deterrence. And secondly, you know, just like the, the Russian or the Chinese uh, declaration of no first use, it's just a statement. It has nothing to do with your capability uh, or the means that you have. Now, in, in other words, they could they could abrogate that policy, you know, that quick if it was in their best interest, and so could we. But, you know, the, the natural trickle down of something like that. Okay, a no first use policy, no launch on warning um, declaration. So there are some that might suggest or would suggest you don't need those kind of capabilities that can rapidly respond. And so now we're working towards um, a policy decision or a declaration that could affect the force structure that we pursue. And I think that, again, goes back to everything we talked about before about how destabilizing that could be. Thank you, sir. Um, 
we've come to the end of our session with General Courtney in the Q&A. And those of you who would like to raise your hand and ask a question directly to the general, you can. I, we have answered all the Q&A. Oh, I do have one more we could answer. And that is general, well, some of our colleagues at Global Strike have said, what's the importance of developing a new warhead for the um, GBSD that would supplement or complement the uh, Mark 21A? Yeah. Uh, that's a wonderful question. Um, I think it's important. I mean, we, we've been in the sustaining of our current warheads for decades now. And I will not say uh, that we've lost the capability to create a new one, um, but we certainly haven't done it uh, for quite a while. I, I think it's a good idea. I think it's a good idea. I think it'd be a great investment in the future. I mean, this is going to be a weapon system that is going to last. It's going to be a, a good, solid weapon system, a good deterrent capability. And I think to put a warhead on it um, that does what it needs to do into that extended period, I think just makes sense. So we'll see where we go on that. Uh, we've had a, a questionnaire come in and said that uh, he'd like to ask a question about the opposite side of the Global Zero people. And that is a number of people have written, uh, one was a Maxwell University, I believe, um, essay that we could deter our adversaries with oh, 500 warheads. And we don't need the uh, 1,550 that we have in our current nuclear deterrent. Again, that's with special bomber counting rules. Uh, in all fairness, I, it's a good question. How would you address this issue of, well, we could deter with uh, significantly fewer weapons than we now have? Um, I, point, I point back to the lessons of history. I mean, it, it would be a huge rewriting of history to say that, you know, 70 years ago, 60 something years ago, that some brilliant thinkers somewhere said, oh, we need a triad. We need submarines, we need bombers with cruise missiles on it, and we need missiles because a triad would be perfect to deter. No, that's not the way it happened. We developed systems that had utility um, in the height of the Cold War, you know, tens of thousands of weapons and systems. Um, but we eventually learned that a triad of forces adequately sized has a stabilizing effect between similarly um, configured adversaries or potential adversaries. It kept Cold War from going hot for decades and decades and decades. Yeah, we fought tangentially all over the world um, through third parties. I mean, during the Cold War, we did. Um, but those conflicts never went hot. We never got too close to that cliff. You know, I, I call it a strategic speed bump. That's what the nuclear triad has developed into. And so when someone makes a statement, well, we can go down to a monad, if we can go down to a small dyad of 500 weapons, I, I, again, I just scratch my head and say, how do you know? How do you know? And it, it eventually, it's not based on studies. It's not based on precedent. Um, it's based on someone's gut feel. And jeopardizing the security of this nation, the stability of the globe, and where we stand today in this country is a lot to jeopardize based on someone's gut feel. And so I think it's a bad idea just because history now suggests what is a good idea. And I think we have it just about right. Well, thank you, General Fortney. Um, thank you for your insightful comments and sharing your value perspectives on strategic insurance. To alert our listeners uh, who are on board here, our July 13th uh, event will be with Uzi Rubin from Israel. It's the next edition of our Nuclear Deterrence and Missile Defense Forum. And I want to thank all of you at I want to thank General Fortney. I want to thank my colleague, Camilla Gunziger, who does such wonderful work in helping arrange all these things. And many thanks, of course, to you, General Fortney, and to everyone else here from here, from us here at the Mitchell Institute. Have a great aerospace day. Thank you. Thank you, sir.